Hey there. All right. So today we, we left off on Romans 9, 30 through 33 last week. And that is going to lead us right into a, a rabbit hole again, or as Chuck Smith likes to say, a tangent. Something that is very pertinent, but it, it goes a little bit off of the scripture. Um, in 30 through 33, we found out that everyone's given an opportunity to find out about salvation. In the Old Testament, all they had to do was to look for God the Father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and um, do the temple worship and the law, but also recognize that it's not doable. Okay, so the salvation came from saying we need a messiah we need that seed that you promised us in genesis 3:16. we need that one that will do what we can't do and so in the new testament obviously that was the person known as jesus um now i'm sure we all know this but there might be someone listening um christ was not his last name <laughs> his name was Jesus of Nazareth, um, but Christ was his title, right? So Jesus the Christ um, is the salvation for us on this side of the law because he completed the law. So he did what humans cannot do. And, and just, so just with that name to clarify, too, there's also a bunch of different Hebrew names for God, depending on how you're referencing him. So right. that not to say that there's other gods or versions of Jesus. Right. It's just that the he in the Hebrew, there's a bunch of different ways to say. And it. those those Hebrew names or those uh, Hebrew names of the Old Testament, the uh, El Shaddai, the uh, Jehovah Jireh, the um, Rapha, the all those names in the Old Testament are the seven I am's of the New Testament. So Jesus just kind of says, hey, I am who I am. They're, um, so they're kind of like uh, the really descriptor words in English. If we were what to did he out. do right. for the nation of Israel? What does he do for us? He's the light. He's the way, the truth, and the life. That Those are all, uh, what are they called, verbs? Uh, I don't know. Adjectives. I'm not good at I think, English. I think it's or adverbs. Or okay, good. Like we'll that. call them adverbs. I don't know. Descriptors. I'm I'm not good at. They're describing English. what he was to us. Exactly. Yep. Christ is anointed. One, you're saying? Okay. Common name. Oh, I got you. Okay, so Jesus was a name in and of itself, too, because it means anointed one. Right, and... Okay, Joshua. Oh, okay. Christ. So, and to, to further narrow it down for those people in that area, it was Jesus of Nazareth. And hence, one of the disciples said, Hey, can anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> <laughs> Well, we found out we it say, can. We say that a lot about, about a lot of places. So we saw that in 30 through 33, they were talking about how Israel was given tons of opportunities. Right. And they were building that temple. And the leader of that temple was basically the cornerstone to build the temple. And it was right there. It was right in the middle of the building lot. And it was so ignored that the weeds grew over it and they actually stumbled over it. That's Jesus Christ, right? Because he came to Israel and they're like, yeah, whatever. We are, you don't fit in our puzzle here of building our temple and worshiping God. So we're just going to ignore you and let the weeds grow over you. Well, that same building block is what the Gentiles recognize through when Jesus said, who do men say that I am? Peter said, you are the Messiah, the son of God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood 
right? Remember that. Flesh and blood has not told you this, but my Father in heaven. All knowledge that we have in our faith of saying, that's true. We didn't see Jesus rise from the dead, but we know for a fact he rose from the dead. All that knowledge is given to us by God. Now, again, if it's God the Father or God the Son or God the Holy Spirit, they're all the same. God gave it to us. Right? So, as long as we want to see the truth, hear the truth, or know the truth, then God gives it to us. Israel didn't. They rejected the truth. Right? So, that's important from Paul's perspective because in chapters 9, 10, and 11, we're talking over and over and over again about how Israel had all these opportunities. And today we'll see how even in Elijah's day, there were opportunities upon opportunities upon opportunities. God gives opportunities to Israel and to the Gentiles and to everyone. So that's where this rabbit hole comes from. Um, flesh and blood. You can do all the Bible studying that you want. You can become so smart that you can memorize the Bible and you're still as lost as when you open the first page. Because unless your mind and heart are connected in understanding it to be true or wanting to understand it to be true, you don't have to get it right off the bat. I did not know that Jesus Christ was important in this whole equation um, for probably 30 years. I thought it was all God and Jesus was one of his or was his son and, you know, he showed us how to live. What would Jesus do? I didn't understand the whole um, how that all fit together. But God has patience. I wanted to know, right? But it took 30 years for my thick skull to finally open up enough for God to say, listen, this is what I mean with your personal Lord and Savior. So, but he's long-suffering, he's patient, and he was with Israel, right? And we'll see that a little bit later on too. So, everyone has a chance. So, when it says flesh and blood, memorizing the Bible, attending church, singing Christian songs, and God bumper stickers are all useless unless your heart's involved. Right, because God doesn't want that mouth service, because that's what Israel was doing. You know, they they were living for their self glory. Look at us; we are righteous. No, you're not. Jesus said, "Your father isn't my father. Your father is Satan." You know, <laughs> and so he's taking the priests and setting them aside and going, "We don't have the same father." Right, because they had the flesh and bone, the flesh and blood view of things. There's flesh and blood and there's spiritual. Right? With flesh and blood you can get nothing. With spiritual you can get everything. Contrast, like everything that God does. If you're not of the light, you're dark. If you're not of Jesus Christ, you're forever cast away from God. There is no middle ground. Right? And same thing with flesh and blood and spirit. Um, the right choice is spirit. The wrong choice is flesh and blood. So the Sadducees and the Pharisees also had that opportunity. Right? We saw that um, Nicodemus was given that opportunity. Now, he was just like Paul. He was a Sadducee. Uh, well, Paul was a Pharisee. But, um, you know, he was a, a religious person. A, a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob fearing person. And he wanted to know the truth because what he was, what this um, Jesus was saying attracted him to want to know more. So... Just his wanting to know the truth, asking, seeking, knocking, which we say over and over again, 
God opened up the courage for him to go to Jesus, even though it was by nightfall. Right. And that's what that's what he did. And when he did. That step of faith. Knowing that he could lose his position if anyone caught him. That step of faith God took and he said, OK, I'm going to let you see the truth. So he was protected by God. Um, I call this Lydiatizing. And when we saw the account of Lydia in Acts 16, I believe it is, um, Lydia was a seller of purple. And uh, I think I have that scripture written down. Yes, I do. All right. So if we look down to Acts 16, 13 through 14 on your notes on page 31, it says, and on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira. So she was a well-to-do businesswoman who worshipped God. Okay, this is almost like me of... Um, 25 years ago um, yeah I believed in God yes I, I I worshiped God and and but I didn't have the whole picture and this is what it says the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul which is the gospel of grace she worshiped God but she didn't quite get it and so when Paul spoke to her, God implanted into her the knowledge that this is the truth. That's what takes it to the next level. Again, on this side of the cross, which Lydia was also, but that's the Holy Spirit. That's when someone's up there on the pulpit and giving a message. And it might be, you know, how the, how the angel slew 186,000 Assyrians and you go oh yeah I can just picture it happening because it really did happen that's not us that's God saying yep so I'm gonna put you in that field right on all the the New Testament writers writing word for word those thousands of words exactly to detail 25, 30 years later, the Holy Spirit takes them right back to that time so that they don't make a mistake. Um, they do it all, the writing in their own personality, but it's exactly as it happened, documented as if it were a motion picture with a frame by frame so you can slowly make sure you write it all down correctly. And that's what God does for us when we hear a message and we're down and it just happens to be the message that we need to hear. That's God reminding us. Right. So um, that that's Lydia tizing from now on. You know what Stephen tizing is. Right. That's when you're overpowered with the Holy Spirit and all the torment and everything that's going on means nothing to you because you're so overjoyed. Right. If you're being burned as a martyr on the stake, you're like, wow, there's so much more light here now. Um, you know, that's the Holy Spirit. Stephen At least I'm you. not cold. Yeah, exactly. Man, I was cold, but now I'm a little bit warmer. Right. That's the way God works. Um, so. It's important that we understand that God wants us all. To know the truth and have the truth set us free. But all we have to do is want to know the truth. And chapters 9, 10, and 11 is Israel saying, I don't want to know the truth. I'm comfortable. I get to sit in the front. I walk down to the market. And people praise me and bow down before me. I got a nice house. I drive a fancy car. And everything that I want, I have. And I have respect. So um, 
that's not going to get you anywhere, right? But they all had a chance to recognize the truth. As a matter of fact, they had the chance standing right before them. It wasn't like our TNT that we'll get into tonight um, where you have to hear and then you have to be sent out and you can't be sent out unless you hear and you had to have to have a preacher in order to hear. Um, that's all. That wasn't even there because Jesus Christ was standing right before them. And he said, this is the truth. And if you don't believe me, I'll show you a couple of miracles and I'll pull Lazarus out from the tomb after four days. Right. And I'll show you all these signs and wonders. I'll curse a fig tree here. I'll you know, I, there's nothing out of my reach. And but still their hearts were not willing to know the truth. So there's a difference. It all comes from the heart. In um, Romans 10, 1, which is our first scripture lesson, it's the same way Paul addresses everyone in his writings. So um, do you want to do that one for us, Andrew? Romans 10, 1, or, or Justin? Here, I'll okay. start with this one. You can get number two. Brothers and sisters, with all my heart, I long for the people of Israel to be saved. I pray to God for them. So Paul, as an Israelite, right? We f we'll find that out in a minute, but he says it in so many different epistles, um, is talking to brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters are Christians. Okay, so he's saying my beloved brother and sisters um, with all my heart, I even want Israel to be saved. Right. I'm not trying to count them out. I, I've been sent out to Jew first, then Gentile, but all of them can receive this message of grace. It's not only for you. So my heart is also wanting to have Israel repent, right? I can tell you also two, and two through four. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. So once again, they tried to work their way into God's grace. Okay, and that was because they thought they made up their own rules. Right? The, the law was set to show what needed to be done but they decided to make their own rules. So in, in verse 5, we can, we can go ahead and read 5. We'll tie it all together. Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. The so, person who oh, does these things will live by them. So um, in, in this text here, it says um, Moses writes about how the law could help it person do what God requires okay so this means God requires a person to fulfill the whole law in order to be counted as righteous that was what he said right at the beginning he said if you even if you don't complete the whole law you have failed the whole law. And Jesus reiterated that on his earthly ministry. He said, if you even think bad about your brother or look lustfully at your neighbor's wife, you've committed murder and you've committed adultery. And if you've broken one, you've broken them all. This is God's um, program right from day one. It was not intended for us to be able to do. So it was intended 
for them, Israel, to call out for a Messiah. God, we can't do this, please. We're trying our hardest, but we fail, and, and we fail over and over again. And that means that we're out of your grace. So please, we, we ask you, send that Messiah. Right? But they refused to. They added more rules and regulations and stipulations and figured, well, if we work a little bit harder on these things, we can work our way into God's grace. And the whole while, God's saying, no, this is not going to work. Right? So the law, the complete and full law, was a requirement. And so it was not doable. God the Father and God the Son had decided right at the beginning when Adam and Eve fell that God the Son would have to give up some of his deity. He couldn't be uh, omnipotent, omnipresent, and also uh, omniscient when he came down on earth because he had to be fully God and fully man. So... You know, he had to be able to endure the sufferings and still keep the law perfectly in order to be counted as righteous, right? And so if he would have just died um, a normal death, then he would have been justified to go back into heaven and be who he was from the beginning, restored back to his glory. But... He said, no, I'm going to give up my life, being perfect, not breaking any of your law. So I'm going to give up my life so they don't have to give up theirs. As long as they believe on me. If they don't, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, so that whomever shall believe shall have eternal life. And it wouldn't have been the same kind of example to us if he had come down and acted like Superman. Everything was invincible. He was unstoppable, flying around, you know, doing all these amazing things that no man could do. Though he did do miracles, but he lived his life as a common man. As a common man with, like I say, 100% fully man, 100% fully God. There were some things that no one knows the day or the hour but my father who was in heaven. Was Jesus lying? No, absolutely not. Because that was part of his omniscience that was sealed from him. Right? Because he had to be, just like you said, vulnerable. Right? If he was on that cross and going, oh, great, there's a couple holes in my hands and it's going to be another three hours and then I'll be off of here. It wouldn't have been the same thing as crying and being rejected. He had to feel the wrath of God every ounce. He was not, he was the only person that was a believer who was not Stephenatized. He had to take every ounce of pain, right? And he had to do it voluntarily so that we don't have to do it. Now, if you decide that you don't want to take his salvation, well, then you get to pay for your own pain. You get to pay for your own sins, every little trinket, forever. And you're also going to have the wrath of God and be forever um, cast away from him. Right. But it's very hard to do. You have to really try hard to reject Christ your whole life. Um, God doesn't let go that easy. You know, he gives everyone opportunities. And, and the perfect example, and I'm probably jumping ahead of myself again, which is common, is Saul. Right. He was religious. He was a man who uh, kept the law. But he wanted to know the truth. Right. So that opened up his heart to be able to um, let Jesus come to him on the road to Damascus. Right. Just like Nicodemus. He had to have that longing. 
it's easy to say who can keep the law. Um, oh, I'm sorry. We have to read Romans 10, 6 through 9. Um, and if you can, Andrew, read it off of the, the printed sheet um, because that's the New International Revised Version. It's on your third page. And that's Romans 10, 6 through 9. It is easy to say, who can keep the whole law, for it is out of reach in heaven, or it is too far down, buried in the depths. So, it almost sounds like it's impossible um, for even the best of intention person to, God has put it out of reach for even the best intentioned person. But that's not what he's saying. He's saying it might seem like it's so far out in heaven. It might seem that it's so deep in the earth that we can't get to righteousness. But it's as simple as your heart and your mouth professing Jesus Christ because he is that righteousness. Right? So... The world, Israel, again, Paul is talking to Israel, says, well, we can't do it. It's just out of our reach. Well, yes, it was meant to be out of our reach, right? But it's, it's, it's inside of us. It's so close that all we have to do is ask Jesus, who already fulfilled it, to take that burden off of our shoulder, right? So when it says... Um, it seems it's out of reach in the heaven or too far down below. Um, that's not what the scripture's saying. It's saying that's the viewpoint of Israel, but it's actually not out of one. So when he says in six through nine, but the w but the way to do what God requires must begin by having faith in him. Scripture says, do not say in your heart who will go up into heaven. That means do not go up into heaven, but bring Christ down. And do not say who will go down into the grave. That means to bring Christ up from the dead. But what it does say is that the message is near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. Right? That's um, quotes from Deuteronomy. It is there. It's, it's, for our, it's not out of our reach. It's, it's actually right in our grasp right there for us to have so Romans 9 says say with your mouth Jesus is Lord believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead then you will be saved it's not a then you could be um, you know eventually you will be it's a then you will be saved it's over for you you've won God has counted you as righteous because you chose his son with your mouth and with your heart. Right? It's not just lip service. Now we're starting to get into this beautiful Romans 10, 10 and 13 through 15. This is what we are called to do as believers. And so... What I'll do is I'll read those, actually, um, because I, I'm going to tie it into my notes. This is what Pastor Daniel calls a TNT. I never heard that before, um, but I love it. Um, Romans 10, um, 10 and 13 through 15. It says, with your heart you believe and are made right with God. We just saw that. With your mouth you say what you believe, and so you are saved. Scripture says one believes in him will never be put to shame. There is no difference between those who are Jews and those who are not. The same Lord is Lord of all. So it doesn't matter if you're one of God's original chosen people or one that's grafted in. We all have the same opportunity. The Lord is the same Lord of all of them. He richly blesses everyone who calls on him. 
Here's the important, important part. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him unless they believe in him? How can they believe in him unless they hear about him? How can they hear about him unless someone preaches to them? How can someone preach to them unless they are sent? Right? And it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The gospel, right? The gospel is Jesus Christ is our way, the truth, our life. He is the one that we come to the Father through. Without him, there is no salvation. I broke it down like this. When you truly believe the first moment you are saved. In that first moment, when you fully believe with your heart and your mouth, like we just saw, that Jesus is the Christ, your personal Savior, you're saved. But that's not our call. God did not put us on this earth to be saved. He put us on this earth as a vessel for others to be saved. Okay, that's our real purpose. The salvation for ourselves is a beautiful thing. We're in. But if we don't share it, it's a useless salvation. Somebody might perish because we didn't say something. So Paul goes into this scripture and breaks it down for us. I'm paraphrasing like I like to do. Okay, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on the Lord unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they haven't ever heard of him? And how can they believe in him? Oh, and how can they ever hear about him unless someone preaches him to them? And how can someone preach or share their testimony or tell them about him unless they allow themselves to be sent? That's why we're here, right? We're here because we're saved. Think of it this way. In the old days, a hundred years ago when I was a kid, they used to have these soda fountain machines. You put a quarter in. And you put your cup underneath and it would pour some water and orange soda into a cup. And then you had a cup of orange soda. Let's say it's a hot day and you put your quarter in and you put the cup underneath there. And the orange soda comes out and it keeps going. And so you guzzle it down, you put it back underneath there and you guzzle it down. You put it back underneath there and you guzzle it down. And you notice this thing isn't stopping. Right? But then you say, hey, you call to everyone at the dorm room and you say, come on out, man. There's free orange soda. So everyone grabs a cup. Well, now you're sharing the abundance of what you have, what you've been given. Right. That's our walk as Christians. Right. We're we're just sharing what we have. We have it. We're full of it. But if we don't share it, there's going to be other people that are still thirsty. Right? It might not be a great example, but that's the way I see it. I like orange soda. I'm with you. <laughs> I'll take some of that. So, to break it down again, um, in the middle of our study notes, or on the bottom of page 32, it says, Someone told us about Jesus Christ. And then, as we searched for the truth, God opened our ears, our eyes, and our heart to that truth. This led us to believing and professing Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, right? Because all we have to do is seek. God implements the knowledge, and that's how we are saved, right? We take that first step. Armed with that truth, the Holy Spirit sends us out to share that truth, that gospel, and I assure you that some of the people that God puts in our path will never have heard the word of truth, the word of salvation, if we hadn't told it to them. 
right? There are certain people that God puts in our life that we're the only one that's ever going to be able to plant that seed. We might not see it happen. We might not see it happen in this lifetime, but that seed that we plant with our friends um, in school or wherever, God takes it from there, right? And we might be the only one who will ever have that conversation with them because God put us in that position, right? It doesn't matter how many notches we have on our belt. It's a matter of do we take every opportunity that God gives us, right? So when we do that, it starts right back at the beginning again. That person is told about Jesus Christ. And then as he searches for the truth, God opens up their ears, eyes, and heart to that truth, leading them to believe and profess Christ as their Lord and Savior. And it goes on and on and on. That's our purpose. That's probably our only purpose. And it has to do with parenting. And God is not surprised if you grow up um, as a secular parent and, you know, and you your kids are raised not knowing Jesus Christ. You never took them to church, but then it dawns on you the truth. It doesn't mean that you missed your job, right? It just means that you weren't, God knew that you wouldn't be raising them from child up in the church, but now you can pray for them. And your change of lifestyle might let your, will let your adult children know, okay, I get it. And God takes it from there, right? But our job is to, as a parent, as an employee, in our workplace as a community member is to just share a little bit of what he's given us right because we were at one point were lost too for some people it was when they were still a baby you know they came to Christ early but for some it was in their mid 50s they wasted 55 years or their path had them not find out about Christ um, for 55 years but that doesn't surprise God that's a, again I have to keep going back to the thief on the cross his one job that God put him on this earth for was not his lifestyle his whole life it was those three seconds on the cross where he said remember me when you get into your into your kingdom to recognize Jesus Christ that statement alone from a man who had no hope has probably saved millions of people's lives because they said if God can save that one who did nothing in his whole life except for profess Jesus Christ in the last second then he can do something for me right so we don't ever have to give up on oh well it's too late now not in God's eyes because God designed the whole thing yes there's free will but if we're open to knowing about him when we're 60 years old then that's the exact right time that was God's plan. So we need to get off of beating ourselves up and say, okay, um, Lord, I'm yours now. And, you know, please pray for, uh, please hear my prayers for my loved ones because I wish I could turn back time and make them understand the beauty that I found just now so late in life. And God will take that prayer and he will apply it. Because God's timeless, okay? God's timeless. So that Romans 10, 10 through um, 
15 are something that you can always look back on to understand that it's not done once we're saved. We still have so much ahead of us. Um, like um, David Jeremiah says, he says, um, there is no retiring um, from being a Christian. You can be a pastor um, and you can be 70 years old. There, There is no retiring. You know, if you are, then maybe you're not in it for the right reasons. But we're we're born to testify to people what Christ has done for us. And sometimes not even through words, right? Because some of the best sermons are spoken without words. Just on your attitude. Just on your going through the fire. Um, not necessarily with a smile on your face, but knowing that, all right, God, I don't understand it, but I trust you. You know, because God is good. Romans ten sixteen. But not all the people of Israel accepted the good news. Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So, again, Israel had Jesus Christ standing right in front of them. And even though this is from the Old Testament, um, it's the same thing. How come Israel didn't accept the good news? This is a prophecy, by the way, a messianic prophecy. Um People say Isaiah 53 is a messianic prophecy. But if you look at Isaiah 52, it actually, and remember the numbers were put in way afterwards. Um, 52.13 starts the prophecy. Andrew, why don't you read 52.13 right through the end of 53 in Isaiah from whatever version you want out of your Bible or, or wherever. Isaiah 52.13 right through 53:12 and let's read what God gave Isaiah for us right this is one of the the most beautiful prophecies of exactly what the Lord would have to endure um, because it actually starts in 52:13 uh, yeah my servant will act wisely he will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told they will see, and what they have not heard they will understand." Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had 
done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So, every single religious person, every single Jew who had knowledge of the scriptures can identify that Isaiah is given a prophecy of a suffering God, right? A deity, not just of a man, but this is pointing to the suffering lamb. So that doesn't fit well, though. That doesn't fit into my plan. I don't like this, you know, being disfigured um, past anyone's recognition, being despised and hated, not looking very attractive, um, being rejected by God himself, um, dying for our transgressions. Well, I don't have transgressions. I keep six out of the Ten Commandments most of the time sometimes. You know, I, I I go to church twice a year whether I want or need to or not. Or, you know, it's so I'm I'm all right, and that's the way these guys were focused on it. Jesus did not mind reading out of the scrolls of Isaiah, right? And he pointed to himself in Scripture all the time. Stephen gave him a history. <laughs> this is the guy you killed, the son of God. Let me start off with Abraham and tell you about him. Right? And he went right through this prophecy as he's explaining to them that they killed God. And what did they do? Yeah. they No, wait. That, I don't want to hear that. Humana, humana, humana. And you can't say you got the wrong man because they tried to kill him a bunch of times. Right. And it wasn't happening except the only way that it was written in the prophecy. And not only that, but we know that he was raised from the dead and we saw this last week. So let's make up the story, pay off the guards. And that story is around today still. Right. That the disciples came and carried him away. Right. And so ignore those 5,000 people that witnessed him. Ignore her 3,000, whatever it was. Ignore the fact that those disciples that were hiding after he was crucified and terrified um, after they saw him went boldly to their death saying, oh, yeah, I've seen him. Right. You don't die for a lie. No one does. A conspiracy is not worth dying for. And then one that you can, you know, back by scripture and events. So this prophecy was out there for Israel. And this scripture lets us know that they had the chance to know the good news, but they chose not to. Right. Um, now on to 817. So faith so comes from hearing the word, from hearing the message. And message that is heard is the message about Christ. So it's one simple message. There's not multiple messages. It's one simple message about Christ, period. And the hearing is important in this scripture because it says... Um, but I ask, didn't the people of Israel hear? 
Of course they did. So there's a difference between physical hearing and spiritual he hearing, right? Because if you want to physically hear something that's spiritual, it ain't happening. But if you want to hear something spiritual that you can't hear physically, that's happening all day long. Right? Because God is the opener of ears. He's the opener of eyes. He's the opener of hearts. But you got to want it. If you don't want it, he ain't opening your eyes, he ain't opening your ears, and he sure isn't opening your heart. So it's, it's that simple. You just got to want to have a question mark. If you don't know anything, and you're totally lost, and you don't believe in anything, and you say, God, if you're real... And this Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. I'm not going to believe it unless you tell me. And, I, and I'm saying this with all sincerity. If you don't tell me, then I won't believe. But I'm willing to listen. You won't even make it to bed. And he will give you the answer. He will come. It's so clear that you can't help but know the truth. You just got to want to try it. You just got to want to know the truth. He's the opener of ears, eyes, and hearts. Yeah, basically the same thing in 18 again, in 19 again, Romans 10, 19. Again, I ask, didn't Israel understand? First, Moses says, I will use people who are not a nation to make you jealous. I will use a nation that has no understanding to make you angry. I believe that this is not only talking to the time when Israel was turning to false gods and Baal worship and, you know, that whole time frame of Moses going up on the mountain and they decided he's been gone too long, so we'll need a new God. I believe it also talks about how Israel finally rejected him in 70 A.D. after all the proof after all the opportunities that he said okay I'm going to go to the Gentiles now a nation that you were supposed to be priests of but you didn't want to because they're dirty right I'm going to go to them through Paul and I'm going to graft them in a nation that you despise a nation that doesn't know about me but they want to. That's why I wanted you to be priests. A nation of priests. Because they want the truth. But you're withholding it from them. So I'll give it to them. And they don't even know they want it yet. But I'm going to give it to them. And then they'll take it. Right. So it's. I will use people who are not a nation. To make you jealous. And the Jews are jealous right now. Of. Jesus Christ going to the Gentiles or God going to the Gentiles um, through Jesus Christ to the point where they're blinded. Scripture, Paul tells us, right, he's, he's the, apo the apostle to the Gentiles. If you look at Peter and even Jesus' brother James, they were all still a little bit legalistic. Right? James says, faith without works is dead. And yes, the law was a, 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 a platform of works. Right? Do this, do this, do this, and God will count you as righteous. Right? But that wasn't the case. So Peter and James and John... They were all working on recognizing Jesus coming into his kingdom, setting up temple worship. Um, not to say that they weren't Messianic Jews. They were 100%. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And none of them say that there's anything that you need to do, um, except, like I say, that James thing. But 
there's a reason for that. None of them said you have to earn your way to heaven. Um, they all said Jesus Christ is the way. No doubt about it. James says, if you have faith and you don't use it for God's purposes, then do you really have faith? There's no proof to it, right? If you really have salvation because you believe in Jesus Christ and you don't go out like we just saw and tell others about it, are you really saved? Or is it a selfish religion? Right? If you don't want to share that cup of orange soda, then are you really a, a unselfish person? No, you're a selfish person. God gave it to me, but I'm not going to waste my time to give it to you. I got other things to do. Or I'm just going to sit here. I got it made now. I'm in. That's the guy who buried the talent. What did you do with the talent I gave you? I buried it. I knew you were a harsh master. So I'm just giving you back what you gave me. What about those other guys, man? They doubled their talents. I put them in charge of a lot because they went out and worked for me. They worked with what I gave them and multiplied it. You sat at home and watched cartoons. You know, what a waste of a salvation. Israel had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. Let's look at verse 20. Then Isaiah boldly speaks about what God says. God said, I was found by those who were not trying to find me. I made myself known to those who were not asking for me. That's us. Right? We were supposed to find out about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and his plan for salvation with the Messiah through Israel, but we didn't. And not only that, when the Messiah actually stood in front of them, they rejected him. So God said, well, I'm going to go to them anyhow through Paul. I'm going to have Paul be my new priest for everyone. And they don't know it yet, but they're going to find me. Because of Paul's ministry and Apollos and um, Timothy and um, uh, I can't think right now. But there's so many that just sprouted out from the gospel of grace that um, turned into billions. Right. And that, and that made Israel jealous. Right. Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, which I am convinced 100% means that the last possible believer is born, right? The last person is born that will turn to Christ at some point in their life. Then God's going to say, okay, I'm taking my people home. And now is the time for Jacob's trouble. Because remember, we left off at 483 years when Jesus rode into town. We had that parenthetical time, which is the age of grace. When that age of grace is done, the church is out of here. Then the last seven years begin. Now, those last seven years, the Holy Spirit that lives within us is gone. The Holy Spirit is still on earth, but all the demons are released. They get free run now. There's no more holding them back because the restrainer, it says, is restraining them right now. But at that, those seven years, the first three and a half will be doable. It'll be ugly, but it'll be doable. The second three and a half years, all of evil is going to be set loose. And 
all of God's wrath is going to be poured out. And no wonder that barely anyone's going to survive. It's going to be torture. Right? And so those that do accept Jesus Christ by the two um, witnesses and by the Holy Spirit um, letting everyone know the gospel and by the 144,000, they're all going to be wiped out the second that they believe. They're going to be beheaded. Boom. Done. All right. You believe? You're done. All right. So it's an ugly time, those last seven years. Um, but Israel will look upon him whom they had pierced. That blindness is going to be gone right at the beginning of the seven years. So if you're not a Messianic Jew who believes in the Messiah right now, when that tribulation starts, you're going to recognize, oh man, he was right there in Isaiah 53. And we didn't see it, but now we see it. All of Israel will recognize him whom they had pierced. Their eyes will be opened forcefully. And their ears and hearts as well. But it'll be it'll be too late actually. Because they're they'll be saved. Those who recognize and, and say, Oh yeah, but it their life will be over. And then there'll still be some who choose to, well, you know what, I'm just going to play along because I value my life. Right? It's a choice. So much for the Happy Days theme song, not playing after that anymore, that's for sure. No, no. Nope. <laughs> um, but here he says, Me sad in, times. Israel had a chance and a chance and a chance. And if you look at the Old Testament, what did Israel do? They worshiped God. They praised God. They were prosperous. They turned to idols. They were um, persecuted. They were, they were punished. They repented. They were prosperous. They turned to idols because it was so good. They were punished. They turned back to God. This went on and on and on and on and on. You think they would have got it. I do so much better when I turn to God. <laughs> you know, I do so much worse when I turn to these false gods. When I look to God for the answer and I ask him, I prosper. When I look to gods and I ask them, I'm punished. Hello? <laughs> you know? Uh, and I shouldn't, I'll probably get picked on when I get up there, you know. Well, Tom, you weren't there. Uh, you know, it, it is tough. Herd mentality, right? We're living in herd mentality right now. You're wearing a Jesus shirt. Isn't that narrow-minded of you? There's so many religions out there that you're that you're claiming aren't real because it's Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You know, there's no other salvation found except through Jesus. Isn't that narrow minded of you? Yeah, right? Right. And and so it's not narrow minded, it's the truth. I'm sorry if it doesn't fit into your mass herd plan, but it is the truth, nevertheless. Uh, and, you know, there's laws. That's God's law. The only way to get to heaven, to me, the creator of everything, is through Jesus Christ. That's the law. God's law. God also has a law called gravity. Right? So you can go up to the 10th floor and you can jump out and say, I don't believe in that law of gravity. It doesn't matter whether you believe in that law of gravity or not. That pavement is coming up to you very quickly. Right? And you can't blame God because 
you didn't believe his law of gravity. He told you, don't jump off a building because you're going to crash. Well, I don't believe that, God. So I'm going to jump off that building and show you that that's not true. Don't blame God when you hit the pavement. So far, so good. (laughs) 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 I'm free, splat. 21? Yes. Romans 21. But Isaiah also speaks about what God says concerning Israel. God said, All day long I have held out my hands. I have held them out to a stubborn people who do not obey me. So this was once again Israel, right? They were stubborn people. He showed them the way. They rejoiced. They were prosperous. They rejected him. They were punished. They were moaning and groaning. And then they repented. And it's just that endless cycle. That's exactly what he's talking about. Now we get into Romans chapter 11. And Paul has to every now and then go back and qualify why he has a right to speak. You can't be a racist and pick on the Jews unless you are a Jew. Because then you're not a racist, right? You're not a Gentile saying, oh, those Jews. Right? So do you want to read that, Andrew 11, 1 through 5? I ask then, did did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know about what scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he appealed to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left, and they are trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So, too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. Right. So, it's very simple. God always has a remnant, right? We're never going to be the majority until the kingdom. Until the time when all this is over. We're always going to be the minority, a small remnant. And if you look at believers, we literally are a small remnant. And and he makes it clear. Don't be afraid that you're going to be outnumbered, right? Because narrow is the way and few find it. Broad is the road that leads to destruction and many will be on it. So he makes it clear, you're going to be outnumbered. You're going to be the minority. You're going to be a remnant. Here, Isaiah is complaining. He's going, oh, I'm the only one. I'm the only one who loves you, Lord. There ain't nobody else. They're all worshiping Baal. Right? And he says, dude, I got 7,000 believers who have not bowed their knee to Baal. Right? I have my remnant. He had it then. He has it now. Right? I kind of wonder. How come Isaiah didn't know that there was 7,000? Were they comfortable believers? Were they kind of like keeping their faith to themselves? They just hadn't bowed down? They weren't holding uh, revivals. Right, because he thought he was the only one. And I'm sure that those 7,000 each thought that they were the only one. You know, and sometimes God puts us in a situation where we're working at a place where no one knows God, no one wants to know God. But then we find out, oh yeah, that's another believer. You know, a conversation sparks or they see your T-shirt or your um, your Bible in your car or whatever, and they go, hey, where do you go to church? I go to church at such and such a place, you know. Um, and it's not easy. At no point in history has God ever made it easy to have faith. Right? 
if it were easy, everyone would do it. Same thing would be if Paul were able to explain what it was like in the third heaven, then people would say, I'm going to be a believer because that's just amazing. I don't care what I have to do down here because I'm going to be a believer. Right? That's not faith anymore. Right? That's why Paul says it's unlawful. It's uh, Again, this is a bad translation. It's not unlawful to speak those things that he saw. You can't put it into words. It would be unlawful to try and justify talking about it because words can't describe it. Words aren't invented that can describe the glory that he saw. Those colors just aren't on our palette. They're not there. All right, think about this. Yep. What about if you're born blind? There you go. Okay, and your mom or your dad tries to explain to you what the aurora borealis looks like or what a sunset looks like or the um, a crystal snowflake looks like. You can't put it into words what you can actually see. Now, if you were born with vision and you lost your sight, that's a different story. You might be able to relate to something. But try and identify what a giraffe looks like to someone who's never seen. Right? If you say they have four legs, well, they're going to picture four legs like they have on their body. Or they're long. Okay, so they're long like the legs that I have. You know, and they have spots on them. Well, what's a spot? And it's a light orange color. Well, I don't understand orange. You can't describe it to do it justice. You know, birth, anything. You can't, if you're blind, you can't understand the glory of it. Same thing with heaven. Now, that, that Noah's Ark Museum, um, we get a glimpse of it when we go into that museum and you saw it on the screen, the presentation, but you can get a gravity for how big this thing was. It's a replica. It's not true to exactly the way God wanted it built, but it's a, it's a decent replica. God will never put the Noah's Ark in plain sight where people can see it, have it be discovered, because that would prove that Noah existed that would prove that the flood happened, and that would be proof that negates faith, right? Faith is knowing for a certainty something that you have not seen. That's faith. As I said last, last week, I did not see Jesus Christ come out of that grave. But my heart saw Jesus Christ come out of that grave. Right? So I didn't see it with my own eyes. But that's why Jesus said, Blessed are those who not having seen have believed. We might have to rename you something other than Thomas. <laughs> yeah, right? It doesn't describe you. I'm probably. a doubter. Yeah. <laughs> Doubting Thomas. We'll have to talk about that. We'll get your second name ready. Why'd you name me Thomas? Yeah, well, 7,000 God had as a remnant. God has his remnant today, um, and they're spread out, right? They're spread out so that the remnant can reach the lost. He doesn't have too little remnant. He doesn't have too many. He has just the amount that he wants so that everyone can be reached. And so if we sit at home and we don't get sent out, then... That's on us, right? Because blessed are the feet of them that walk um, to, to let others know. That's Romans 11, 6. We'll end it on that. And if they are chosen by grace, then they can't work for it. If that were true, grace wouldn't be grace anymore. So, again, the scripture is kind of pointing to if they're chosen by grace, meaning that some are chosen, some are not, that's not correct. 
they are chosen because they will choose. So God has seen their life play out. He knows who's going to choose him and who's going to reject him or his son. Um, and so they're chosen because they chose him. Okay. So obviously God knew it before they knew it. But the grace is poured out and it's a free gift. You can't work for it. It says here. If you can earn your way to heaven by works then that means God owes you as payment grace right so if you work for someone then in return they owe you payment you can't work for grace because it's a free gift otherwise it's not a free gift right and to say oh okay you know what uh, I'll take that free gift but I'll pay you back is the same thing it's null and void you can't work for something that first of all is um, infinitely expensive right it's priceless that's what I'm thinking of you can't work for something that's priceless and paid off a penny at a time um, it doesn't work that way but if someone gives you a gift of something that's priceless and out of joy you let other people know how they too can receive this free gift that's working that's working out of gratitude for what God has done and not working in order to receive from God Paul is very clear on this and that's the difference between the law abiding messianic Jews Right, which I count the disciples and that whole group, the kingdom, repent, the kingdom is at hand, people. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Jesus Christ is the reigner and ruler. Jesus Christ is the only way, but they also tie in works, not for salvation, but out of obligation. Right, whereas we are under grace. We can't earn it. We have to appreciate it. And that's it. So next week we'll be doing this remotely. Because um, like I said, two Sundays I'll be gone. And two Wednesdays I'll be 